and welcome back to the channel. Today, on my interview series, I'm on the sofa. I'm on the sofa today with Chris Hare. Hello, Chris. Hi, Richard. Now, you are a local historian, an author, yeah. um, and you're into all sorts of bits and bobs around the <laughs> Sussex area. Yeah, a bit like you. Uh, I managed to make a bit, bit of a career about local history that people are obviously very interested in, and I've written about the history of Sussex, and I've written particularly about Worthing. Uh, uh, where we both live. Um, but I've had this lifelong interest in Hilaire Belloc. And I've got your book here, yeah, yeah. which, uh, if you're interested, we, we're going to discuss the, the life and works um, and the, poli the politics, I suppose, mm. and the beliefs of Hilaire Belloc, mm. who was very much well known in Sussex. And those of you who remember on the TV the... Um, now, what was the programme? The magician. Um, Paul Daniels? No, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I should have remembered this before because I've walked round his windmill, the windmill, and uh, the TV series with oh, the Oh, uh, Jonathan Creek. Jonathan Creek. Mm. Thank you very mm. much. Mm. There we are. An embarrassing mm. moment there. <laughs> Those of you who... Let me start that again. Those of you who remember Jonathan Creek will, will know the windmill. That was filmed... In it was filmed in the windmill, which He's, Belloc owned, which Belloc owned back in the 19. So he, he lived there, he, he lived in Kingsland House from 1905 until his death in 1953. And the windmill was part of the property, part of the property, mm. yeah. And I know for um, a short period of time there was a, a preservation society that looked after it, but unfortunately, at the moment, um, they lost the lease or something happened, mm. and and it, it's. It's still there and it's in reasonable nick, but I think a lot of people have been worried about it because it was open to the public. People could come in, but you can't now. But anyway, we'll, we'll skip over that. And I suppose the thing about um, Belloc, Richard, is that um, he spoke to a very broad audience. So it, 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 he's, he lived in Sussex, but really he's got so much to tell us wherever we live in the world. You know, he was a bit of a philosopher. He, he was a, a politician, but in a in a meaningful sense. He he's tired of party politics. He he saw the bigger picture, and he saw I think the future in many ways. And that's really we want to tie him into today and where we are with some of the um, the strange things that the government have been doing or the behaviour of the government um, with what was going on, I suppose, with him in in his life mm. and. Um, and just reflecting, I suppose, on a, on using the past to perhaps illustrate s some of the future, because he could, as you say, you could see into the future a little bit. Mm. I mean, he didn't he didn't declare himself. <laughs> it wasn't a clairvoyant or anything like that. Uh -huh. um, so, tell us uh, then a little bit about the man, because your yeah. book is a series of essays about it. It isn't a biography in in huge detail in that way. No, it isn't. And and some excellent biographies have been written. And I'm, I'm not in a position to compete with that. And how the book was written uh, came about as a suggestion from a friend. Because uh, I said, I'm struggling with this book. Because I know so much about him. I care so much about him. I want to do him justice, but I'm, I'm stuck. Right. And he said, well, why don't you write a series of essays? Don't think of it as a book. Write about Belloc and religion, Belloc and politics, Belloc and the countryside, Belloc and old age. So that's how I've done it. And so the essays are linked but they can also be read in, in, in yes. a freestanding way. And I, th I think that makes the book uh, different to a biography because you can go to these subjects and, and see what he thought about it and what he said, and, and it's relevant for us today. Absolutely. So let's explore then some of him and, and how it is relevant today because we, we have gone through some quite a lot of turmoil and I don't need to remind people of the last three years mm. and how things have changed. So... Tell us a little bit about him as a man, where he came yeah. from and all of that. Yes, yeah, so, so very briefly, um, he, he was born in, uh, in dramatic circumstances, or, or his early years were. So he was born of an English mother and a French father, and he was born in France, a little village not far from Paris. And within two years of his birth, his father had died, aged only in his 40s, so completely unexpectedly. The Franco-Prussian War broke out, so Prussia, um, which then became the German Confederation, invaded France. The French were humiliated at the Battle of Sedan, and then revolution. 
broke out in Paris. The first communist revolution, the Paris Commune, put down with great savagery. About 20,000 communards were summarily executed. And you think how different that is to English history. Yes. You know, our equivalent were the Trafalgar Square riots where a few rioters got their heads broken by police truncheons. You know, you can't equate that with no. 20,000 people being summarily executed. Now, of course, you're far too young to remember that. Right. But, you know, he, as a consequence, his mother, not surprised, and he came back to England. And, and she had a certain amount of money. They were a middle-class family. And she trusted a friend of hers who was an investor to invest it for it for her and he embezzled the lot. <laughs> well, that's uh, <laughs> nothing unusual. Nothing, in that, no. <laughs> uh, and, and that's how he came to live in the Sussex village of Slindon. Now, viewers will think, oh, living in a West Sussex village, you have to have lots of money. Well, you do now, yeah. don't you? I you mean, do and now. Slindon is a very yeah. lovely yeah. Um, quintessential English for those that don't know w with beautiful uh, buildings with gardens and you know lots of landscape and rolling hills near Arundel. Yeah, near Arundel. But back then, really, <laughs> that was a sign of her on her uppers. She couldn't afford to live in London. Right. She couldn't afford to live where people of her class were living. So she came to a Sussex village. I mean, they weren't slumming it, but compared to what he might have expected, yes. it, was, it was coming down in the world. Uh, and the consequence of all of this was that he had a lifelong suspicion of Prussian militarism. Uh, he had a lifelong suspicion of revolutionaries because although he understood the causes that led to revolution, he also suspected, I think rightly, that revolutions tend to just create new tyrannies mm. uh, because the type of people who lead revolutions um, are the sort of people who see themselves as the new answer to the problem and uh, yes and, <laughs> and, and, and that's very interesting for today because we have a lot of uh, protests going on yeah with our 15 minute cities uh, trials that are going on and you do see uh, these people who are seeing themselves in some ways as leading the people but people do need to be led don't people they? people need to be led but of course it's got to be the right leadership yes uh, so he he was always on the side of the poor. He was always on the side of the oppressed. But, uh, and and he, he could see that sometimes revolution was inevitable, but always be wary of these charismatic figures who are persuasive and, and who f have a, a following. Mm. But then when they get into power, all the things that they denounced in terms of tyranny and manipulation, they then start... Yes. employing themselves <laughs> and, and we see that every yeah. time you get uh, the candidate for prime minister coming along touting around how wonderful things are going to be and then in the next breath as soon as they've achieved that post all those things seem to just vanish mm. so he he was definitely right in that area yeah and he um um perhaps is moving moving on a bit mm. um but he um so he was an outsider this is the point right um he when he went to France, he was regarded as an Englishman. In England, a lot of people regarded as a Frenchman. Uh, so although he was brought up here, um, he, he always had the French R's. When he spoke, there was a roll in of his oh, R's. I see, right. Um, and um, he got into Oxford, which was a major achievement because he was a Catholic. And although Catholics were no longer barred from university, it was still a hurdle. Uh, but he was incredibly gifted. Um, he wrote a wonderful poem when he was only uh, nine years of age about the wooden effigy in Slindon Church. Uh, and, you know, prodigious talent. Um, and his, his mother had connections high up in the Catholic Church and they, they got him into, into Oxford. But by the time he went there, he was two years older than all the other undergraduates because he'd served one year in the French army because right. he thought he didn't have to, but he did. Oh, right, okay. And then he fell in love um, with an Irish-American, Elodie Hogan. And this young man, he got on a boat across the Atlantic. He got lit, she lived in California, and he got lifts and walked the whole of America to ask for a hand in marriage. I mean, 
Yeah. Talk about a gap year. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> but what happened when he got there? Oh, uh, she'd gone into a convent. <laughs> she'd gone into she'd a, gone a convent. convent. I know, I read that and <laughs> I did laugh. Yeah, he got into a he came back all the way to England and then he got a letter saying, oh, she's left the convent. And he did it all over again. Uh, and this time, though, his mother helped pay for the passage. Right. And, it was a much, and, and they did get married and she came to England and they had a very, very happy marriage. But sadly, she died uh, quite young, quite in, her, young yeah. in her early 40s. But he went to Oxford and, you know, he was the other undergraduates to him, although he was only two years older, he'd lived this life. Yes. He knew so much. And uh, there's this description of him first speaking at the Oxford Union. And because his name wasn't known, mm. a lot of the members were shuffling out, who's he? And after a few lines, everyone stopped and he held them. Right. Uh, and everyone thought, this is someone who's, who's going to be big in the future. And he could have gone into politics. Yeah, well, he did. Yes. He did, but it, it wasn't very successful. It wasn't very, that's right, yes. <laughs> it wasn't very successful. He was, he was far too honest, Richard, to be a good politician. And uh, there's an, uh, the first election he, he stood for uh, in 1905 uh, in Salford South, which was a marginal constituency. So viewers will know marginal constituencies are where it can go either way. Mm. You know, it, it's, not, it's not a safe seat. And back then... Uh, elections were popular. People turned out to election meetings because it was good sport. Oh, right. Because the candidates would be harangued or even have things thrown at them. Yes. And people liked to see how well they stood up to the, this, this sort of uh, trial by combat, you know. Well, exactly. Well, we, and, and it'd be <laughs> lovely to do that now, it'd be wouldn't lovely it? To, and, of course, now it's all stage-managed, isn't it? Yes. You get an election and there you have the leaders of the political parties, with these rather sombre-looking young people holding placards. Yes. And then they're talking to this selected audience. And oh. the whole thing is utterly stage-managed. Smoke and mirrors. Yes. Yeah. And it, yes it's... But back then, 1905, the candidates had to go through a baptism of fire. Mm. There'd be hundreds or thousands of people in these great halls, and they'd be shouted at, and they'd be... If they didn't give a straight answer, people wouldn't put up with it. And so... Uh, Belloc's uh, election agent said, look, Belloc, this constituency has quite a lot of Catholics in, Irish Catholics, but it's also got a lot of nonconformists. So what you mustn't do is mention religion, because that will be a death knell. Yes. So Belloc listened, first meeting, packed people, and he got up and he said, this is a rosary. <laughs> <laughs> I tell these beads three times a day, and if you reject me on account of my religion, I will thank God I've been spared the indignity of being your representative. Hush silence and then huge cheering. Wow. Because he was just honest. Yes. And so even the people who were against him thought, yeah, this is an honest man. Um, and, and he won the election and, and, uh, against all the odds. We have an election uh, looming. We don't know exactly when it is, but it's, you know, it, it's like within a year or 18 months, mm. whatever. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing to see now? Yeah. The haranguing yeah. and for honest people to step forward. For honest people to step. And I mean, I think there are some honest people left. Um, but of course, um, I was involved in politics myself. I stood in the 1997 general election. Oh, were you? Did you? Uh, and... Um, and I found myself after the election, even though I'm not going to say which party I was because it doesn't, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. Right. It doesn't matter. But I got one of the highest swings in the country. So you'd think you'd be commended. Mm. But actually, I, I was told, well, I, we, don't, we don't know if you're going to continue your selection because you said this and you said that. Um, and, uh, and in the end, I gave it up. I, I was so disillusioned. And the same thing with Bellock. He did five years in Parliament, and this is, this is all a stitch-up. Yes. The, the two front benches are pretending they're different, but on all the big issues, it's the same policy. Yes, um, and, and we see that today now yeah. more than ever. But it was much worse now, much yes. worse. I mean, the, the, you look back on it, and you can say, yes, there were clear differences between Conservative and Liberal and Labour. But you look at it now, mm. and, and you think, really? There is no opposition no, no. To, the, to, the, to the things that people are talking about. There is no representation to and, a lot of things. And you just don't... So 
we know without going to the rights and wrongs of it, you take COVID, you take the COVID vaccine, you take Ukraine, you take um, the no harm bill, you it, it, all sorts of things. It, it's not whether the rights and wrongs. We just don't hear from the mainstream politicians or the mainstream media the other side. No. And and that's and that Bellop was always. It's, he'd always say, well, well, what's the other side? We haven't heard. Mm. What, 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 you know. Uh, so on Ireland, for instance, you know, he, he took up the cause in Ireland uh, because he said, well, the Irish nationalists, their point of view isn't being heard in this country. And, um, and that didn't make him popular. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, well, we've seen with Andrew Bridgen talking mm. about the harms of the vaccine. If you start to press on the other side of the argument, you are castigated, you're thrown out, you're, and, um, you're, you're made to, to be ridiculed. You are the object of ridicule, mm. which, which is um, well, and, and not it's, so good. It's so dif difficult, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, what you're doing on your channel and, and, and people like John Campbell on his, you know, putting another view out there, which is invaluable. But I, and the two things Belloc identified a hundred years ago, which I think are so true, he said, I think the way politics is going is that it will become more and more trivial and it will end up as a circus. Uh, it just entertainers. And yes. you see with Boris Johnson, basically an entertainer. Yes. That's uh, not a serious person. <laughs> and that's PMQs. I mean, they talk of it as the yeah, Punch and Judy, it's, it's, it's don't they? The PMQs is, is just people aren't listening to the other parts of the argument. No. You know, if anybody's looking at, the, at, at what the Parliament do, does, they're just looking at PMQs. And, and it's all those sound bites. That's all they want to, yeah, to and, represent. And, but when you, when you think about it, nothing's really been said. And no, no, nothing's been said. And, <laughs> and it's like, yes, my honourable friend this and my honourable friend, and of course we're going to do that. And, and it is just this, this invisible tennis, really. And, and at the end of it, you think, well, have we achieved anything? Have we achieved anything? Yeah. And, and uh, mostly not. So and tell and us... Then, uh, yeah, just briefly, no, the, go. the other thing he identified was the power and manipulation of the media. Yes. So uh, Lord Rothermere and uh, Lord Beaverbrook, um, you know, created lords um, and, and really they started to dictate the politics. And of course they were making loads of money. Mm. And, and, and Belloc, you know the term the gutter press, mm. that was Belloc. Oh, was it? And at a press conference, he was, he, he, he's, uh, Beaverbrook, North, uh, North um, Rothermere journalists were, you know, really asking his questions and he goes, you know, your masters are in the gutter. You know, I, I'm not going to play your game. Uh, and if you libel me, I will hit back at you. And, and but politicians today, you know, they're terrified of Murdoch and, and all these people. Yes. They, they, they want to ameliorate them. Oh, what will look good in the sun? Abs what will look yes. good in the mail? Not, not what, what is the truth. No, and what's but, going to benefit yeah. people. And, and he, I thought he's spot on. Mm. And a hundred years ago, of course, it was nothing like it is now. But it was all these things we see today in, in the media and the politics, they were all coming to the fore in his days. And it's just escalated. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. So tell us um, ab about his faith, because mm. Mm. in the, the three months that I've been doing my channel here, mm. talking about stuff, and as more and more people have been telling me and becoming more frightened as they've discovered mm stuff that's being rolled out without a mandate and mm. they're feeling pretty helpless. I am getting a lot more people coming and, and telling me about their religion or their mm. spirituality. Mm. Mm. And clearly there's those that say we are in the book of Revelation now, mm. it's the end of, you know, and all of this. And I, I do think to myself, well, maybe they did think that at the, in the beginning of the First World or War. Or the Black Death. Or the Black <laughs> Death or, you know, any time where there's a big problem mm. um, they all you know throw their arms up but people are sort of turning to religion a lot mm. more so faith mm. still holds true to a lot of people yes so how did it um, ha he as you said he was a Catholic yeah and his Christian faith is crucial mm. and and I would I suppose I would describe him perhaps as a as a primitive Christian in the sense he wasn't interested in deep theology he just felt the truth and I think he understood that 
that everything that he did in life, he was able to do because of his faith. It was his rock on which he stood, and he was able to withstand all the pressure, all the criticism, all the controversy. And without it, he'd have been a weaker man. Um, it's interesting, he, he, he said Europe is the faith and the faith is Europe. So he saw European civilization as a product of Christianity and before that of, of the Roman Empire. Mm. So the Roman Empire created civilization uh, and then the Roman Empire crumbled, but the Christian church survived the crumbling of the empire. And yes, of course, he admitted there were lots of problems with the Catholic Church. But he said if that hadn't have been there, if we'd fallen back into the paganism that was there before, that would have been a much more brutal, violent, uncompromising world. And I think, I don't know if you as are aware, but really the whole concept of mercy is very much a, comes from Christian ethos. I went to some fascinating talks some years ago uh, about the Greek world. A mm. couple of women did them. They were so knowledgeable. And they said that the Greeks had no concept of mercy. I, I had no idea of this. Right. <laughs> you know, so, so, so you know the Spartans, they yeah, just slaughter. To the, the death. You slaughter the enemy, of course you do. Yes. Unless, Take no uh, presents. unless there, there's some women you want as concubines or some strong young men you could use as slaves. Right. Uh, so, and I know, yes, you know, the, the Spanish Inquisition, the Crusades, Christianity let itself down. But there was still the idea of mercy and, and of behaving in a certain way to other people, I think. Right. And Belloc, he understood that and, 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 and he, he lived by that. And I think, I mean, I, th I try to, I mean, I'm, I wouldn't class myself as religious by any means, but I do try to, that I, in all the things I do, um, that I live by, I suppose, my own personal code. Mm. But that would also say, uh, I, I mean, I'm just not very good at ha getting back at people if they do you wrong. I'm not, I'm not really interested, you know, and mm. if, if I fall out of favour with somebody, I'll find that I'll go, oh, well, so be it. I'm, I'm not I'm not holding a vengeance and I'm not sort of there to sort of come back and and, and give them one, really, to sort of get on with my life. And, and he was he wasn't, you know, some Christians you meet, they're very full of themselves, aren't they? Right. Oh, I'm saved. Yeah. I mean, he's yes. never, you know, who, what, what an arrogant, ridiculous thing. You know, we do our best and, and we wait the outcome. Yes, know? yes. <laughs> and uh, um, I think he'd be very alarmed today at, at some of the things uh, that, that, are, that, that are going on, you know, with the LGBTQ. Mm. And um, th there's um, a video recently of Peter Tatchell talking to the Archbishop of Canterbury you know, and, and making some uh, pretty outrageous assertions. And the Archbishop is just, he's just not standing up for not himself. No, I think a lot of people uh, are disappointed uh, in yeah, the church. And, yeah. and, and not standing up for the truth. Right. And again, you know, Thatcher was saying things that weren't true, factually. Yes. And the Archbishop should have just said that. Yeah. And, 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 and that, that, you know, Belloc's standing by the truth. Was he uh, a man who could, uh, in doing that, standing by the truth, not worry too much if he offended people? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And he because did. that's what uh, we yeah, seem to yeah. be in a very... <laughs> we don't want to... We don't want to upset and offend no. because, you know, the world is going to collapse on us by the cancellation culture. <laughs> the cancellation culture. I mean, we should never be rude to people. And, and sometimes it's hard. Yes. But if people, you know, blank us or don't have anything to do with this because of what we say, well, we just have to accept that. It's sad. Yes. But I think a lot of people say, oh, oh, perhaps I better change my view because I'll lose my friends. Absolutely. <laughs> and and so we are very influenced. I mean, we're obviously influenced by our friends. Mm. And we were saying just before we, we recorded that people can, they'll have a, an opinion on something and then their friends will have an a, a, a opinion on something else and they feel that they need to then also endorse that opinion, even if they yeah. perhaps don't, just to keep friends. Uh, and also we live in a world where everyone has different opinions, don't they? Yes. So like 200 years ago, you had orthodoxy. And there's a bad side to that because a lot of people suffered, didn't they? I mean, you wouldn't want to be a gay man <laughs> even 50 years ago. No. And, um, uh, and you, 
you know, or you wouldn't want to have been a Roman Catholic 200 years ago in Britain. You wouldn't want to have been a Protestant in France. Uh, so I, Belloc wouldn't have said, and I certainly wouldn't say, oh, we, it's all the good old days. Now everything's dreadful. We, mm. we, you know, some things are obviously better, but it's this, it's this wishy-washy thing we've got. We you know. do seem to be very uncertain yeah. of who we are. And we need to know. And, and, and so with, 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 with COVID and the vaccine, there are questions, aren't there, that need to be answered. Well, they're not even been asked. No, no. <laughs> so, uh, or, or the Ukraine war. It's a terrible war. All wars are terrible. It's a shocking thing that that invasion took place. But no one ever seems to ask, well, how did the Russians see it? Yes. And what about Russia's history of being invaded by the Nazis, invaded by France. That doesn't justify the invasion, but it seems to me this war is, uh, flames have been put on the fire. We, we, you know, we've got to send tanks, we've got to send planes. It does but, seem that we are forced to take one side over another. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it all started with the avatars of the flag. And I mean, even mm. down in Worthing, mm. I, I don't know who, where I live, I don't know who told the council that on the pier we have to have their flag, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. the U Ukraine flag. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but it would have been nice, actually, if people said, actually, that's what we want. Mm. But it just seemed to hit society and an opinion was forced on us. It was forced. That, that's the point, isn't it? There's no debate. And you've got someone like Peter Hitchens, mm. who you know, he doesn't support Putin. He doesn't support the invasion, but he's making points. Um, and you think, well, why isn't, why isn't this on the BBC and ITV news? Why are we all being bludgeoned into this war? And, and I, I think America has, has, I think I'm right, 42 billion they put into the Ukraine war. And we put in 4.2 billion and we haven't got, we've got hospital waiting lists. Yes. People can't get heart operations. They can't get cancer operations. And we're putting all this money into a war why are our politicians saying we need a peace conference? Yeah. Why aren't we saying the people who live in these disputed areas, obviously Putin's vote, we can't take any, but we can't <laughs> accept that at all. No. But there could be a UN uh, monitored vote on where the, which country those people want to live in. Now, Putin might reject it, yeah. and then we'd know where we it, stood. But no, it's not being put forward. Always being put forward is war, more war. Yes, and there's clearly an agenda there, mm. but nobody is even prepared to or allowed to question it, no. like so much, so much that's mm. gone on. What would uh, Belloc have done had he been in a position, say he had been the Prime Minister of England and he was there and we were in this situation, what, what do you think he would do? I, I, well, you see, that's an interesting question, isn't it? And, and I do feel for people who do have principles, who then become prime ministers. Uh, you take uh, Giorgio Maloney in Italy, mm. interesting woman. Yes. Come up from humble origins, fought her way through, strong principles. But now she seems, you know, it's the inevitability of having to be pragmatic. So can you be pragmatic without abandoning your principles? Mm. That's the question. So um, I think Belloc, he'd never have been prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> he never not an honest, no, no honest man is going to really end but up I think or we survive. Have, we have got people uh, in Britain um, who I think are better than the rest. And, um, and, and to not be part of political, I can, three names I can think of, you know, different parties. Actually, one of them's dead. <laughs> so he would make a brilliant prime minister because he couldn't take you to war <laughs> on have, one thing. Well, interesting, Charlie Kennedy. Right. Liberal Democrats. Yes. He was against the Iraq war on principle. He said, where's the evidence? Uh, and, 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 and he was correct, I think, in hindsight. And of course, he was also against the Liberal Democrats joining the coalition government. He said, what about our principles? Because mm. you know, they abandoned their flagship policy yes. to, get, to get into government. I think he was a good man. And, and um, in the present government, I'm not really that impressed, but like Kemi Badenoch, I yes. think... Uh, the impressive thing about her is she answers questions. She answers them directly. She answers she? them directly, and and without the um, well, directly. That's yeah. that's it. Without yeah. glibness. Yeah. W w w without platitudes. Um, uh, and I think I think she's someone to watch, and and someone perhaps for the future. 
And with Labour, um, you know, Rebecca Long Bailey, I think she's she's been quite good because um, uh, kicked out by Keir Starmer. Yes, I, think, I, I have to say, Mark, I was I I didn't I wasn't a great fan of hers. To to I think she was too much in Corbyn's pocket. That's how I felt. But um, but, but she you know she she expressed her opinion on abortion, which which didn't make her popular. She expressed um, uh, views on Israel that didn't make her popular, um, and 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 she hasn't, you know, sought to ingratiate herself to Starmer to get back in. Um, well, that's always a good sign. Yeah, I think a, yes, that's a good sign if you're not ingratiate and, and just go it's swallowing everything. I think it's awful, Richard, when you get people who are on one side, yeah. and then the other person wins, who they denounced, and then suddenly they're brilliant, and you yes. think, well, where where's your where's integrity? It, yes. No, I, I agree, and of course. You've got to give people time, haven't you? I mean, people get into that world. They're desperately trying to find their way around things and they may say things. And one thing I found doing this kind of work is that you say something and people think that that's your policy for the rest of your life. That's mm. how, and as you go on, you change your mind. Because circumstances change. Yeah. And, and you, you, you yeah. know, you talk to somebody yeah. and they, they put over a persuasive mm. argument and you go, oh, I hadn't thought of it like that. Mm. And so you do change and develop. Mm. And, and I'm sure that some of these people who are currently there may well do. But the system, it seems, is quite rigged, mm. um, particularly against us, the, the sovereign people of this land, who don't seem to get much of a look in. And the, the government now seems very much more um, dictating things instead of getting us to engage by not asking the other questions. I think that's the first stage, isn't it? Let's just have honest debate. Mm. Uh, never mind what policies we believe in or what we want. Let's at least have the big issues properly debated with both sides given. So going back to uh, Herr Belloc, mm. of course, there's a lot of things that we could t talk mm. about. Mm. And um, of course, if you're interested, we're here to <laughs> and I, help Chris get some sales on your books. Which and of course, and of course we'll I want to a, sell the book yeah. naturally, but I really think people will gain a lot by, by reading about him. Mm. And, and one thing we haven't touched on, he's, he's writing about mortality. Yes. We're not very good in the modern world at facing mortality. No, you know we like to put it off. Yes, and 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 in a way we can with modern medicine. And it's been sanitised, death, hasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, in a house like mine, two up, two down, you may have had your parlour room, mm. and when someone died, they were laid out in the room, mm. and people would come mm. and pay their respects. And 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 these days, people aren't so much dying at home; they're ferried to hospital. Or, or, and, yeah, and yeah, you know, you you don't see them, and in, in the COVID years, of course, you weren't allowed to see them, which even was more. Just a terrible thing, a terrible thing indeed. So yes, uh, so he spoke a lot about death, and 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 you know, I found that uh, I've I've been through a terrible loss and trauma in, in in my life and my family, and I found his writings a great comfort, and he said it's stupid to resent unhappiness, it's stupid to resent loss because we'll all encounter it yes uh, and the thing is, is is to accept it and not try and push it away uh, and realize that all the time you're alive there are good things you can do and there are people who need you yes uh, and, and that's i think the appropriate response absolutely and i know people um can get into some very deep depression and dark mm. places mm. and i mean i remember when i was losing my eye and i was in severe pain mm. i I thought at the time that I was pretty suicidal, yeah. um, but and I and I was really desperate. But I knew I wouldn't do anything silly because I had my children who were dependent on me, mm. and the love of them, albeit that they had their own worlds, and you know, mm. Dad was just having a, an eye problem, but. I knew that I they and that magic between family was very mm. important. So I couldn't do anything. You you. You write here in your book, at the, towards the end here, this fascinating line, and I can get you to read the poem that, that <laughs> follows to end off, because he, 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 he remember he's spoken much about his books or his works and things, but you say here, Belloc rather thought that modern medicine was prolonging life at the expense of good living. And I remember reading that thinking, 
That's so true today, but with Big Pharma, mm. just keeping you alive so you continue to spend money on all those medicines. Or even some medicines actually making you ill yes. so they can get you another medicine oh, to that's keep what, you exactly. pottering on. That's what yeah. I mean. They, you know, you're ill, but they haven't quite fixed you. And they don't want you to have herbal rem remedies and medicinal things that you could find out in the mm. world. It's almost as if they just want you to keep buying our product or be addicted to, yes. the, to the big dealer absolutely mm -hmm. um so he's got this lovely little yeah. ditty yeah he was very good at, at summing things up in small little rhymes of old when folk lay sick and sorely tried the doctors gave them physic and they died <laughs> but here's a happier age for now we know both how to make men sick and keep them so yes so not much has changed really <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and we've got we've got people we've got we've got people of ninety living wonderful, healthy lives. Yes. My, my own mother's ninety-two, but we've also got people in homes mm. for years and years, just being kept alive with medicines with no real quality of life. Yes, uh, and and that is a very sad uh, situation. It is, absolutely, and and we, you know, my father suffered from dementia. We looked after him as best we could until it became so overwhelming mm. that he went into a home and within a year he was dead. Mm. But it's only a one way journey once you're put into that home. But the the quality of life that he had because of the financial restrictions that was basically on them and on us as, mm. as people, as, um, as uh, offspring trying to pay for everything, meant that he was in a room with perhaps 15 others, basically sitting down in armchairs, getting through the day, getting up, lifted up on a, on a, a pulley system, taken to the loo, dumped back in the chair with a television, daytime TV that he had no comprehension anymore of what was going on, you know, um, stuff in the attic whatever it's called or uh, location location all these sort of things and and blaring at them and i just thought this is no way to look after people as they're they're you know going towards the end of life and to meet their maker well how did what happened to belloc at the end you yeah, because he, he sort of ended up with with this form of dementia um and um it was because he lost one son in the first world war and then he lost a second son in the oh. Second World War, and I think that double blow. Yes. Also, he was he never. Um, France obviously capitulated at the beginning of the Second World War, and then um, Marshal Petain uh, collaborated with the Germans, and he had the Vichy State. And I think he couldn't believe that Petain, who was a man he admired, could have d cut a deal with Hitler. So I think you know that that political philosophical things and the personal loss and he, he didn't really recover he had a stroke um, on 30th of January 1942 and he lived another 11 years um, and he was increasingly frail and forgetful but he never lost his sense of humor and, um, and, 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 and he was never feeling sorry for himself that's the great thing you know he I think he accepted this is it yeah. but there's a greater thing coming you know there's more to life than just this life. Than just the physical body. Mm. Mm. Well, it's uh, an interesting read, Chris, and thank you very much for coming and talking about Pleasure. it. Pleasure, thank um, you. Herr Belloc, the, the politics of living, and as you say, very much of our time and the times we're going through reflected in his times. Mm. Um, the link will be in the description if you fancy... Uh, a little bit of a read from something a bit different from the norm that we've been talking about, escape from the modern day and go back uh, a few decades. Thank you so much, Chris. Thanks, Richard. Absolutely interesting. Thank you.